Watch the top corner. Hi, everyone. My name is Travis Steffens. I'm the regional director for the Explorers Club and for Ontario and Nunavut in Canada. And this is our first virtual meeting. Uh, and we're going to be going live now to the rest of the membership here in Canada. So this is a, 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 a first for us and we're excited uh, to have you all join us. Um, before we get started, I wanted to say thanks to Exploring by the City of Pants and Joe Gabrowski there. They're hosting this event through, through their um, um, their program and uh, and uh, managing the logistics of it. So if you ever want to see explorers, uh, scientists, and such from around the world, um, exploring by Sea of Pants can connect you and your and students uh, around the world with them. So please check out their website, um, exploringbytheseat.com. I also want to give a big shout out and thanks to Kensington Tours and Travel Edge. They have been uh, amazing supporters and sponsors of the Explorers Club here in Canada, um, especially for our Toronto um, uh, events that we hold every month. Um, they kindly have donated their space to us. Um, they provide us with food and drink, and they've been uh, with us for a number of years and have been major supporters um, um, and beyond meetings, even supporting some of our, our, our awards as well. And as many of you know, the travel industry is being hit quite hard by this COVID crisis that we're facing around the world. And so when this eventually ends, and it will end, make sure you take those hard-earned dollars uh, for those of you that, uh, that fared well out of the situation and spend them at these travel companies that have been helping us over the years uh, up to this point, um, uh, as well as Adventure Canada, who's been with us for a number of years, um, make sure you're supporting these companies and helping them uh, through this time of crisis when this all gets out. I wanna give a, a shout out to, to David Galbraith. It was actually his idea that we, we host these virtual events and I'm glad he suggested it because it's a great way for us to, to forget about some of the stuff that's going on and maybe talk about some positive stuff and some thing like exploration, for example. So thanks David for, for, for suggesting this event. Uh, I'm going to pass this off to, to the Canadian chapter chair, George Karunas, and he's going to uh, let us know some news, after which I will introduce our two speakers um, uh, for, the tonight's, uh, for tonight's talk. All right. Thank you so much, Travis. I uh, appreciate that. A little uh, toast to everyone, for, uh, as we would normally do uh, for our monthly meetings, um, this being our very first virtual one. And... Um, Couple of things. Last night we were supposed to be uh, uh, taking part in a thing called the Chapter Connect, which is this new initiative by uh, headquarters in New York to allow each chapter to talk to the rest of the membership about what goes on in their chapter and some of the people and things that happen in those places. And last week we were. Uh, uh, we had a presentation by Todd Tai, who is the chapter chair for Australia and New Zealand. I was scheduled to do it yesterday, and we had some technical problems getting the Facebook stream to work properly. So unfortunately, if you tried to tune in, I apologize. It was fraught with technical issues. We are going to reschedule that. I don't know if it's gonna be next week or the week after that, but uh, I assure you that uh, we will be doing that. So that'll be a fun thing to tune into as well. But I highly recommend tuning into all of them so that you can get to learn about who's who in the different chapters of the club. And there are many, many chapters. So there's lots of opportunity there. Um, speaking of headquarters, I would like to give a particular shout out to Brianna Rowe, who is on here right now for her recent election to the board of directors. And uh, that is quite an accomplishment. Brianna, if you want to just chime in quickly and maybe, I don't know, say a word or two uh, about, uh, about, I don't know, the future of the club and your place in it. Sure. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm so excited that I got on the uh, board of directors Explorers club and, um, you know, I started as a Canadian chapter member. I moved down to New York a few years ago and I've been hanging out at the club every week since then. And um, I think there's a lot going on right now at headquarters and it's gonna to translate to a lot of really cool opportunities for every member around the world. So it's really an exciting time to, to be on the, the board of directors. Yeah, thank you so much. It is absolutely a very exciting time for the club right now, in particular with our uh, blossoming uh, partnership or sponsorship rather, I suppose, with uh, Discovery Networks. And uh, that is in the works right now. 
Um, I can assure you that one of the biggest things that they are doing right now is making sure that they have a really good uh, team in place for the approvals of these uh, grants, these discovery grants. And so they're putting uh, these committees together. There's a science committee and there's also an editorial committee that uh, will be overseeing all of these applications, making sure they're up to snuff in terms of science and representation of the club, but also have entertainment value for discovery so that they can get their money's worth out of it. So there's so much talent for them to pull from. Um, what they're doing right now is putting those things in place and they're very close to having at least a preliminary application online. So look for an announcement on that coming soon. Uh, the timing couldn't be any better for us as a club because with everything being shut down, everyone is in these uh, rather difficult times. And so we, we certainly are grateful to have this deal in place now, particularly at this time. And I'm personally very excited. Um, I've been uh, in on some of the meetings and I really like where this is headed. So uh, it, very, very exciting times for the club coming up. So that's going to be great. So tune in for the, uh, the chapter connects, watch out for uh, updates coming from headquarters on all of the news that's going on. ECAD of course has been rescheduled, it is now gonna be October. Um, it is instead of Lowell Thomas, there is gonna be no Lowell Thomas dinner this year, which is typically held in October. So this will be uh, replacing Lowell Thomas for 2020. And I was told that the number of tickets, typically there's over 1500 tickets that are sold for ECAD. I believe there were maybe half a dozen that were returned. So that's really great. That's telling me that people really want to go to ECAD and are looking forward to it, even though it has been rescheduled. There's been so few ticket returns. So that's really great. Exciting times for the club. I'm really looking forward to, uh, to hearing about uh, the great trail with this uh, presentation tonight. That's all I have for right now. As always, everyone who's involved in the Canadian chapter, if you have any questions or comments, just reach out to me uh, uh, through whatever means. I'm, I'm easy to get a hold of. All my contact info is on the chapter site. So thank you so much. Back to you, Travis. Wonderful, thanks a lot. Um, I hope you all can hear me. Thumbs up from anyone if they, they can. Great, perfect. Um, well, it's my absolute pleasure to, to introduce our next two speakers. Um, they are doing some incredible stuff and, uh, and, and they're actually in the middle of an expedition as we speak. And so they're dealing with a lot of interesting issues in this, uh, during this global crisis. Um, and they're going to share with us some stuff. But, but Sean Morton and Sonia Richmond, both conservationists. Sean's a photographer. Sonia uh, herself has a PhD from the University of Toronto, where she um, studied conservation biology and forestry. And she has spent as much time as possible outside doing field research on songbirds. Their love of long distance hiking began with Ontario's 900 kilometer long Bruce Trail. And when they hiked the 800 kilometer um, Camino um, Francis in Spain, um, and they did this back in 2016. In 2019, Sean and Sonia sold their house in Ontario. Sonia took a leave from her job and the two set out to hike the 24,000 kilometer Great Trail, formerly known as the Trans Canada Trail to promote youth engagement in nature and especially through birding because um, they're passionate birders and conservationists. So it's with my absolute pleasure to introduce the two of them and they'll be taking over the talk in just a moment um, and, uh, and, and uh, presenting you their, their presentation. Afterwards, for those that are here with us in Zoom, they can, um, they can stick around and um, ask some questions. I'll moderate some questions, then we'll say goodbye for the evening in about an hour's time. Um, and you might see that uh, our cameras go dark for a moment, but you will see the presentation uh, load up in just a moment. So Sonia and Sean, thank you very much. Welcome to the Explorers Club and, uh, and you're live now to the Canadian chapter. Okay, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. We will just uh, switch over to PowerPoint and start sharing our slides. So hopefully it's coming across for everyone. Everyone can give a thumbs up. Perfect, glad to hear that. Well, thank you everyone for taking a few minutes to listen to our talk today. My name is Sean Morton and I'm joined of course with Sonia Richmond, one of the club members of the Explorers Club. 
Until recently, we lived in Ontario. Sonia worked at Bird Studies Canada, and I worked as an architectural and landscape photographer. Over the past year, as has been mentioned, we sold our house, put our careers on hold, and donated most of our possessions to pay for and begin a four-year, 24,000-kilometer hike across Canada on the Great Trail. Today, we'll be explaining a little more in detail of what we're doing, sharing some of the reasons for undertaking this journey, and elaborating on our goal of diversifying participation in the outdoors and connecting people to nature through birding. We will then share some of the photos and stories we've had from the trail, explain why we're encouraging people to connect through nature to citizen science and birding in particular, and outline some of the things we've learned during our first year on the trail. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, the Great Trail is formally called the Trans-Canada Trail. It's the longest multi-use trail system in the world. It's a network of rail trails, pathways, greenways, waterways, and roads that connects 15,000 communities here in Canada across the country. The 24,000 kilometer trail stretches from east to west to north and supports a range of outdoor activities from hiking and trail running to cycling and cross-country skiing, to paddling, snowmobiling, ATVing, and of course, bird watching. But most people don't realize it, the Great Trail is within 30 minutes of 80% of Canadians. This means if you've ever walked on a trail in your community, it's likely you've already trekked part of the Great Trail. Now, most people aren't crazy enough to walk the entire length of this trail on their own. Our parents desperately wish we weren't as well. In fact, fewer people have completed the entire trail on foot than have gone to the moon. It's so large that if you started walking now, it would take you between three and four years to finish. That is, if you were to keep hiking every day through every type of weather condition and during every season. To put this in perspective, when stretched out end to end, the Great Trail reaches almost two thirds of the way around the globe. Walking its full length is equivalent to walking the Appalachian Trail seven times in a row or walking the Camino de Santiago 30 times back to back to back. So obviously this is not an expedition in the same vein as that of Alexander Mackenzie, who traveled to the Pacific and Arctic Oceans through territories that were previously uncharted by Europeans. We're not leaving the surface of the planet like Chris Hadfield, and we won't set any kind of records for speed, distance, or firsts. When non-scientists and non-explorers see us, they don't think we look like their idea of explorers or adventurers, and we know this because without fail, they laugh at us every time we say this. But that's exactly the point that we're trying to make to young people and to those outside the scientific and outdoor communities. To be an explorer or an adventurer, you don't need to be a professional athlete. You don't need specialized skills or a lot of expensive equipment, and you don't need to be super rich. To start, all you really need is simple curiosity and the courage to see where it takes you. This is the message we are sharing as we cross Canada in the hopes of inspiring the next generation of scientists, adventurers, and outdoor explorers. Now, when people hear Sean describing the distances that we walk on this trail, that it's equivalent to walking two thirds of the way around the world, the first question most people often ask is why on earth are you doing this? Well, our main reason was that we felt like the digital world was starting to take over our lives and those of our family members. We were spending our days working in front of computers, our nights watching Netflix, and in between we were constantly checking Facebook, Instagram, and emails. At the same time, a younger family member was skipping more than 40 days of high school each semester. He was stealing and lying, and eventually he lost most of his friends all just to play video games. And in a way, it's no wonder. Studies have shown that the effects of video gaming and social media on the brain are stronger and more addictive than those of drugs like heroin. So even though we were almost constantly connected to Wi-Fi, we were becoming increasingly disconnected from each other, the natural world, and everything that was actually important in our own lives. So we realized that it was time to begin recharging ourselves and not just our devices. And we wanted to do something that was a little bit different. Now, neither one of us fits the archetype of a typical explorer. While we've tracked across parts of Europe and Canada, we've also managed to get lost in our own hometown while day hiking. Despite this, we were born to wander, to experience, to explore and to discover the natural world. There's no making sense of it. And trust me, our parents have tried for years. Today, so many people have the sense that we've already been everywhere, that everything is already known, that the answer to every question can just simply be Googled. But as many of you will probably agree, almost none of that is true. In fact, there are new species being discovered every year. There are many parts of this planet and others that are still left to explore. And in the face of climate change, innovation is perhaps more important now than it ever was before. 
Sean and I have come to accept that we're not going to be the next great researchers or innovators in Canada. Neither one of us will ever be on the level of scientists like Roger Tomlinson, the inventor of GIS, or astronaut Chris Hadfield, or David Suzuki, or Roberta Bondar. Simply put, we aren't explorers like them. But after a lot of trekking and a few visits to the pub, uh, we came to wonder, what if we could funnel our passion? What if we could put everything we had into one big thing, and through that endeavor, we could inspire individuals and youth across the country? What if by doing something big that few individuals had done before us, we could get the public interested in exploration again and reconnected with nature? What if by showcasing the natural beauty of this country, by demonstrating how fascinating that nature can be and how exciting discovery is, one young scientist would stand up and become the next great Canadian contributor? We wanted to do something a little different. And from these questions, we realized that though neither of us may be, ever be an outstanding scientist, perhaps we could inspire the next individual who is. So what could we do? Well, we were looking for something large enough to capture people's attention and spark their curiosity. And we were already enthusiastic long distance hikers. Between 2014 and 2018, step by step, we'd hiked across part of Ontario on the Bruce Trail. We'd ventured across Spain on the Camino Frances. We trekked across France on the Via Pondensis. And soon after that, we hiked the length of Portugal on the Camino Portuguese. These were inspiring and life-changing adventures, and the moment each one ended, we immediately began planning our next one. So we thought, why not use the world's longest trail to capture people's attention and try to inspire them to get outside, to be curious, to ask questions, to explore, and to connect with nature on a more regular basis. Now, nature means different things to different people. For many adventurers and explorers, your minds might stray to interesting mountaintops or volcanoes deep sea adventures or outer space. Outside this group, I think it's fair to say that most people tend to imagine tracts of pristine, untouched wilderness, or we might think of national or provincial parks or conservation areas. What many of us tend to overlook is that nature can actually be found everywhere, even in Canada's largest cities. It can be found in green spaces and river corridors. It can be found in the trees outside our windows, in the plants that come up between the cracks in the pavement, and in the birds at, the, at our feeders and in our own backyards. There are opportunities to explore and discover everywhere. All we have to do is step outside our doors. Now this seemingly simple and obvious realization is important because if we let ourselves think of nature, adventure and exploration as something that exists only in pristine wilderness or in some far off exotic location, the result is that we spend the majority of our time in front of screens planning or fantasizing our about our next big trip, which we may or may not actually have a chance to take. On a daily basis, digital landscapes are no replacement for natural ones. And if we lose that connection with the physical world, we eventually lose our curiosity, our desire to explore, learn and protect nature. That simple idea is ultimately what led us to walk across the second biggest country in the world in the name of conservation and with the goal of inspiring people of all ages, cultural backgrounds, abilities, genders, orientations, and identities to get outside and connect to nature on a more regular basis through birding. So with the idea of trekking in mind and our goal set, what did it take to transform all this into action? Well, it took just over a year of preparations and to cover many of the initial costs, we began selling off and donating most of our possessions. And at the end of the year, we sold Sonia's house. Beyond these preparations, we began purchasing our hiking gear. Sonia spent the year sending out hundreds of sponsorship requests, and I began reaching out to the media and finding contacts across the country. In addition to which, we designed a logo, had shirts printed, learned about web design, built our own website, and started our social media accounts. Despite some initial astonishment from friends and family alike, our year of planning went amazingly well. We attracted two main sponsors, Bird Studies Canada and Bride and Solutions of Calgary, Alberta. In addition to which, we won the Bailey Memorial Fund, a grant dedicated to aiding in the promotion of birding and scientific research. And we got very lucky. The first individual striving to complete the trek, Dana Mizey, was approaching the conclusion of his 10-year endeavor. And the national press took an interest in writing articles and the notion of one person completing the hike while others were just setting out. The results of this attention led to about 10 articles written on our time getting ready and garnered a decent amount of community interest. On a more practical level, the logistics of planning a four-year hike are a little bit challenging, as you can understand. The most comprehensive set of guidebooks were completed by Sue Lebrecht in 2005, 
when entire sections of the Trans-Canada Trail either didn't exist or took different routes and have long since been abandoned. Adding to this, Lebrecht's books only covered a handful of provinces and excluded places like Ontario, the Prairies, the West Coast, and Northern sections. The province of BC and Northwest Territories have both since also had excellent guidebooks published, yet at the moment, both of these are more than a decade out of date. The reality, therefore, is, is that there is no comprehensive guidebook for the Great Trail. Add to this the fact that many people and municipalities simply don't know where the trail is and that many of the trail sections are not well mapped or signed. This means on stretches like, say, Newfoundland's to Rail Trail, which crosses just over 800 kilometers, you might encounter only a handful of trail markers along the way. As a result, we've used a lot of topography and satellite maps in planning. We've spent a lot of time reading and ordering information, as well as talking to people to learn about different regions. And while on the trail, we've relied heavily on our notes, the Great Trail app, Google Maps, and of course, local help. In terms of gear and packing, as you can imagine, weight is paramount in almost all the decisions we've made. Because of this, you quickly reduce how much clothing you're taking. Trust us, debates about how many toothbrushes or pairs of underwear you're carrying were regular in our world. Add to this are the necessities for camping, including our tent, tarp, sleeping bag, stove, pots, cups, water system, and flashlights. And though weight was central to the decisions of our gear choices, so too was cost and comfort. As a result, while we did greatly reduce the weight in our backpacks before we set out, ultimately we never purchased the lightest and therefore the most expensive gear. Indeed, we went for equipment that was relatively lightweight and which provided a degree of comfort and which came with only a moderate price tag. Once the weight of our base gear was as low as we could get it, we added what was required to deliver a daily blog, regular social media updates, and provide virtual presentations daily to our backpacks. This includes a tablet, several Nikon DLSR cameras, several lenses ranging from a birding scope to landscape lenses to a macro lens. In addition to which, we have our cell phone, DJI drone, Garmin device, several portable battery packs to recharge our gear, and the seemingly infinite number of cables to connect these devices together. So I imagine you're wondering, what's it been like so far? Well, we started on June 1st, 2019, and we trekked for 165 days and covered just over 3,300 kilometers, crossing from Cape Spear, Newfoundland to Riviera de Quebec. And en route, we've experienced some truly amazing things. We've been the first to see the sunrise in North America. We've scaled cliffs on rope ladders, walked along coastal footpaths, seen icebergs and puffins, spent evenings on the sides of crystal clear lakes, gone days in remote wilderness without meeting anyone else, seen caribou, moose, and black bears, as well as over 150 species of birds. We visited epic national parks, explored provincial reserves, sat in ancient cathedrals, learned about Acadian culture, forded ice cold rivers, wandered tidal flats, and even waded into the Atlantic Ocean in a section where the Great Trail was washed out. We've walked on the ocean floor with goats. We've slept in a haunted jail cell, trekked through snow blizzards, sheltered from tropical storms, and yes, even survived a hurricane. We've trekked on days in which it was minus 20 and days in which it was plus 45, sometimes in the same week. And along the way, we've experienced overwhelming generosity, random acts of kindness, and countless words of encouragement. Each day, depending on weather, terrain, and water availability, we hike an average of between 20 and 25 kilometers on the Great Trail, which is something almost anyone can do. This number, however, has varied from five kilometers on the East Coast Trail in Newfoundland, when we ended up scaling a cliff face on a rope in the middle of a snowstorm, to as much as 50 kilometers in one day on the roadways between Sackville and Dieppe, New Brunswick, when we ran out of water and there seemed to be only endless stretches of private property, and we were continually told that we had to keep walking and we were not allowed to stop for the night. Generally, we carry everything we need on our backs. Our packs weigh between 40 and 50 pounds, though this has gone up to over 60 pounds at times, depending on how much food we carry. The image you see here reflects approximately what we would carry for two people hiking for seven days without alternatives for resupply. This means that we carry enough to each have two packets of oatmeal for breakfast, along with our coffee or tea, have two trail bars each day, and we split a mixture of two packets of rice and one packet of beans for dinner each night. For, for our daily routine, each day usually involves us getting up around 6 or 7 a.m., having breakfast, packing up by 8 a.m., hiking till 5.30 or 6 at night, at which point we set up camp, wash our clothes, wash ourselves if we're incredibly lucky, make dinner, filter our water for the evening and the next day. And then around 8 or 9, about the time you simply want to stop moving, lay down, or maybe even die on the tough days, our work day actually begins. It's at this time when we sit down to write our journals. We draft and post the daily blog, process photographs, update our social media, answer our emails and inquiries if possible, which typically takes us to about 1 a.m. 
if we're preparing for a presentation or finalizing an article for publication, this time can be pushed later into the evening. On more than a few occasions, we have to work right through the night and go without sleeping. All of this is done on a budget of $20 a day, which means that most of the time we're trekking, we can't. Either wild camping on the side of the trail where it's permitted or in provincial, national, or private campgrounds when available. At times, we've been fortunate enough to be invited into people's homes to rest, get cleaned, and launder our clothes, which is a wonderful heaven sent. Now, $20 a day doesn't sound like a lot, but spread over 1,200 days, it does add up, especially when you consider that these expenses also come on top of the cost of outfitting ourselves, maintaining our gear and electronics, switching our camping equipment between seasons, replacing worn out clothing and gear, in addition to simple costly mistakes, such as dropping a camera on a beach, or destroying a pair of Zeiss binoculars on coastal rocks, or staying in hotels to avoid a hurricane. This is what the first 165 days in a year on the Great Trail have generally looked like. But of course, it wasn't all that bad. In terms of the trails we ventured along, our cross-country adventure began in Newfoundland, where we were screeched in, kissed a cod, attended a boil up on the beach, and met some of the friendliest people in Canada. The Great Trail in Newfoundland offers two very different experiences along two very different routes. The East Coast Trail is a series of 25 footpaths for hikers that traces the rugged coast of the Avalon Peninsula, whereas the Trailway Trail follows the bed of the former provincial railway through the wild, remote, and sparsely populated center of the province. We began our hike on the East Coast Trail, which in places was very steep and rugged, involving rope-assisted climbs and descents while in other stretches it followed boardwalks, pebble beaches, and pleasant forested pathways. Along the way we saw humpbacked and minky whales, seals, bald eagles, and crystal blue icebergs off the coast. We marveled at towering cliffs and headlands, saw sea stacks emerging out of the mist like something from Lord of the Rings, and watched as water was shot 40 meters into the air by a natural wave-driven geyser. We also walked across a 50 meter suspension bridge and admired the Berry Head Arch. In addition, we visited the famous, the famous Cape Spear Lighthouse, which is at the very easternmost point in North America, and the colony of Avalon, which was one of the founding European settlements in Canada. Perhaps most impressive of all was seeing North America's largest colony of Atlantic puffins in the Whitless Bay Ecological Reserve near Bay Bulls. So in addition to puffins and eagles, along the ECT, we also got to see a wide variety of other seabirds, including northern gannets, razor bills, black guillemots, and common mirrors. Amid all of this, we were treated like family by strangers, invited to boil-ups, and enjoyed impromptu kitchen parties along the way. By comparison, much of the Trailway Trail, which crosses the province from east to west, is a gravel track that's used primarily by a thriving and generous community of ATV eaters and snowmobilers. The trail took us through the remote and spectacular scenery of the boreal forest which is something we both long to see as it's an essential ecosystem and is considered North America's bird nursery. So much so that many of the birds you see in your own backyards rely on the boreal. Sonia, however, will be discussing that later. On the trailway, many of our days began with the sounds of loons on pristine lakes and the sight of the sun rising over bogs filled with wildflowers. We were privileged to watch a herd of caribou run across the plateau in front of us one day, be visited by moose regularly and discover these two bears inside of our tent one morning as well as share the trail with a rare pine marten one afternoon. In terms of birds, we enjoyed species such as the boreal chickadee, Canada jay, ruby crown kinglets, pine grosbeak, flycatchers, and countless warblers. As we crossed Newfoundland, most of our adventure was in the pristine wilderness, which was a luxury. But when we reached Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, that changed somewhat. So the great trail in Cape Breton and Nova Scotia began right off the ferry terminal in North Sydney, and it took us up into the famous Cape Breton Highlands National Park, to the home of Alexander Graham Bell, and along the Celtic shoreline into Nova Scotia. En route, the trail provided panoramic views down the coast. It took us through scenic forests and past several important birding areas. One of the highlights for us was the 92 kilometer long stretch known as the Celtic Shores Trail, which runs along the coast of Cape Breton Island, winding through the communities of Judique, Port Hood, Mabu, and Inverness. Along the way, we found active fishing harbors, pristine beaches, exhilarating views, museums, and quite a few restaurants, which made a lovely change from all the rice and beans that we consumed in Newfoundland. We also marveled at the eagles of the Brass Door Lake region and enjoyed a selection of shorebirds, including semi-palmated plovers, 
leased sandpipers, ruddy turnstones, and willets. In addition to all of this, we enjoyed the Celtic music of the Rankin family and savored fresh lobster while watching the sun set in the Atlantic Ocean. Beyond the culture of Cape Breton, the natural wonders of Nova Scotia were a highlight for us as well. Among our favorites was visiting the Bay of Fundy and getting to see a tidal bore. The Bay of Fundy is home to 16 meter tides, which are the highest in the world and a definite must see. When the tide comes in, it starts to fill all the rivers that naturally flow out into the bay. A tidal bore looks like a wall of water traveling up these rivers and occurs at the exact moment when rivers change direction and begin flowing in the opposite way. In addition to the tides, the vast mud flats that are exposed at low tide are some of the most important stopover points for migrating shorebirds in North America. We visited during the fall and so had the chance to see lots of different species, including osprey, greater yellowlegs, black-bellied plovers, ring-necked pheasants, and wood ducks. This, of course, is only a sampling of the amazing trails and sites we saw in Nova Scotia. Sections of the Great Trail, including the incredible Guysboro Nature Trail, the beautiful Muscat Ovid Harbor, the Coal Harbor and Atlantic Seaview Trails throughout the province also will provide amazing ways not only to see the countryside, but let you explore nature. They also enable you to take a cultural journey through Mi'kmaq and Acadian history. So next on our journey, we ventured across to Prince Edward Island. And we would have to say that out of the 3000 kilometers of Great Trail in the Maritime Provinces, in our opinion, the crown jewel was probably PEI's 435 kilometers of Confederation Trail. While PEI might be the nation's smallest province, it boasts one of the nicest trail systems that we've encountered yet. The Confederation Trail runs from one tip of the island to the other, forming a complex network of pathways across the province. The entire trail is kept in immaculate condition, and it's composed of an extraordinarily well cared for pathways under a corridor of green shade trees. It features information plaques along the route, distant signage, and shelters for resting, picnicking, or camping along the way. All of those are things that we could only have dreamed of on other sections of the Great Trail. The nature of the Confederation Trail, with its beautiful rolling hills scenery, quaint villages, and broad-based seascapes, make it the perfect means for island-wide exploration. You really couldn't ask for more. So in Prince Edward Island, we toured the province from the ferry to the Confederation Bridge, relishing the hospitality of Charlottetown, resting on the red sand of its endless beaches, and enjoying the natural beauty of the island while taking in as much of Green Gables as we could. En route across the province, we saw a ridiculous number of great blue herons, as well as a wide variety of other bird species, including common yellowthroats and northern flickers. Shorebirds like the sanderlings shown here, and of course, a wide variety of waterfowl as well. In terms of exploring nature, PEI is a wonder that is great to be experienced. The next province we visited, and the last we'll talk about today, was New Brunswick, where we explored Acadian heritage, relaxed in peaceful forests, and waded through marshlands while bird watching, and enjoyed amazing urban trails. If there's one word to describe the Great Trail in New Brunswick, it would be diverse. The trail took us from the base of the Confederation Bridge at a wonderful birding hotspot known as Cape Germain, around the Bay of Fundy through pristine coastal wilderness to the famous Fundy footpath. Afterward, we followed roads through rolling forested hills and spent days hiking along the beautiful St. John River. New Brunswick also offers some fantastic urban pathways through its larger cities, Moncton, St. John, and Fredericton. In the university town of Sackville, the Great Trail becomes a fully accessible boardwalk that took us through a 55 acre waterfowl park. Here, over 160 species of birds, including double crested cormorants, American widgeon, northern pintails, hooded mergansers, and white throated sparrows, as well as 200 species of plants, have been reported in the marsh. And even though it was pouring rain when we walked through here, the trail was full of people out enjoying the beautiful natural space within the city limits. The Riverside Trail of Fredericton was another example of wonderful urban pathway in New Brunswick. The paved walkway took us along the banks of the St. John River, past beautiful historic estates, and underneath a canopy of old hardwood trees. It took us to some of the capital city's attractions, including the Beaverbrook Art Gallery and the Christchurch Cathedral. And along the way, we passed an imaginative street art, trail pavilions, and interpretive signs explaining the region's history. For all these reasons, the urban trails of New Brunswick, as well as the places they lead to, are an amazing experience. Now, there's really no way to summarize five months of hiking across our beautiful country in a presentation like this, but hopefully our whirlwind tour has given you an idea of some of the different experiences Canada's East Coast and the Great Trail have to offer in the Maritime Provinces. 
We've shown you photos of incredible wilderness and wildlife, and we've shared some of our favorite urban pathways. The reality is by connecting 15,000 communities across Canada and by visiting all the provincial capitals, quite a bit of the trail is actually in or very close to urban areas. In other words, much of the Great Trail is outside the door of most Canadians. And because of this, it's free, easily accessible, and open to everyone to explore in their own way. So as Canadians, we have these wonderful opportunities to connect with nature, literally in our own backyards, in our communities, and on the Great Trail. We're told all the time that being outside increases our self-esteem and self-awareness, that reduces the effects of stress and anxiety, it improves our concentration, and fosters creativity, innovation, and prompts exploration. Yet many Canadians and youth don't capitalize on the amazing opportunities that are available. So why not? Well, there's a lot of reasons. There's often a sense that time in nature is non-productive and therefore a waste. There's a pervading social fear that being outside is dangerous and it should be avoided. But it also has to do with the sense that connecting with nature is only possible or worthwhile if we're fully immersed in pristine nature or that the real outdoor adventure requires us to travel to far off in exotic locations. And unfortunately, there's also a perception that outdoor activities are something only to be enjoyed by a select few in special locations and at certain times. We've been taught to think that nature is supposed to look a certain way, that to be outdoors, we have to look a certain way or be a certain type of person, but none of this is true. Nature is not one special place and it's not for one special person. Nature is wherever someone is trying to find it. The pursuit of nature and time outdoors is enough to make you a birder, an explorer and an outdoors person. And this is the point that we've been trying to emphasize in communities as we track. Beyond these, however, the biggest issue, especially among youth, is screen time. If given a choice between going outside or playing video games, most children will choose to play games, and most other people will gravitate towards spending time on Facebook or Instagram rather than going for a walk. Indeed, many youth clubs like the Scouts and Girl Guides, trail organizations and nature groups, as well as birding associations, are finding it challenging to entice younger individuals outdoors to have an interest in nature and to be curious and to explore, largely because such activities take them offline and away from their screens. So what we need to do is find a way to focus the time spent in digital landscapes towards time spent in natural ones. So we are trying to help people do just that by reconnecting to nature through birding. When people hear this, their first question often is, why birds? Well, birds are a great way to connect with nature because they're free and fun to watch and they are literally everywhere, no matter who you are or where you live, whether it's in an apartment building or a condo tower in the city, somewhere in the suburbs or way out in the country, it is impossible to go outside your door and not hear or see at least one bird. And if you think I'm kidding, I challenge you to prove me wrong. And birds aren't just found in nature. They appear on our stamps and our currency and the logos of our sports teams and in our art. Almost everyone has a memory of the sound of a bird calling, whether it's the sound of loons at the cottage or the scream of a red-tailed hawk in a movie. Most people are actually already closet birders, which means that birds are pretty much the perfect gateway species to connecting with nature and other wildlife. More than that, birds are a great way to connect with nature because they need our help. According to the State of Canada's Birds Report, some groups of birds are actually doing very well, like waterfowl and birds of prey. Actually, those two groups represent a really nice example of how widespread conservation efforts across North America have made a huge difference in helping birds rebound and thrive. Other groups like grassland bird and birds and aerial insectivores, uh, which are birds that feed on flying insects, are not doing so well and they need our help. So where do we begin? Well, the first step is simply to learn your birds and one of the best places to begin is in your own backyard. If you don't already know who regularly comes to visit, start by learning the names and habits of those birds. Figure out things like what time of year do they visit? What type of food do they like? What do they sound like? If there are some species that look similar, try to identify some markings or features that you can use to tell them apart. Like maybe one has a white eye ring or another one has a striped crown. Once you start to recognize different bird species, you can begin to share your observations and start making a difference by becoming a citizen scientist. For those of you who might be unfamiliar with this, a citizen scientist is anyone who makes observations about birds or nature and then reports them online to help scientists understand how our wildlife populations are doing. 
This is great because it means that anyone can do it, whether you're five years old or 95, whether you're an amateur or you hold a PhD, as long as you love going outside, finding really cool things and learning to identify what they are, you can be a citizen scientist. Choosing to become part of the citizen science community is not only fun, it also makes a huge difference to conservation. Without the millions of observations that have been submitted by people just like us, there's no way that a few scientists would be able to monitor the health of all our wildlife populations in an area the size of one of our provinces, let alone Canada or North America. Birds and wildlife need our help, and in order to understand which populations are thriving and which ones are not, scientists are increasingly using data collected by citizen scientists. Now, learning your birds and doing citizen science might sound like a lot of hard work, and it might sound difficult, but there's good news. There are several apps that can be downloaded for free, which makes the whole process both easy and a whole lot of fun. The app that we most frequently use and recommend to others is called iNaturalist. So iNaturalist is great because it's really simple to use. You take, basically just take a photo of something in nature and upload the photo to the app. You'll then be presented with a series of other pictures that you can compare your own with to help you identify what you just took a picture of. Once you've made your identification, your observation will be submitted and you will then get confirmation for your ID from experts within the iNaturalist community. So now you've not only shared the photo you took with others, but you've also turned it into highly valuable data that can be used by scientists to help our wildlife populations. The other great thing about iNaturalist is that it works for more than just birds. If you're into butterflies or other insects, bats, reptiles, mammals, trees, wildflowers, whatever you're interested in, you can use this app to help you identify it. In addition, iNaturalist also keeps track of your observations. So you can build a life list of all the species you've seen and where you've seen them. If you use the Seek version of the app, which is really great for kids, you'll be invited to enter different challenges. And as you build up your collection of species, you'll start to earn badges for different achievements. Now for anyone with kids who plays video games or for any of you who might play games yourself, this might be starting to sound a little bit familiar. You travel around collecting things, you complete various challenges, you compete with your friends, and you earn achievements. So citizen science is actually a lot like video gaming, which is something that many people already love to do, but there are several very important differences. It gets you outside and being active. It teaches you about birds and other wildlife. It helps you connect with the natural world and ask questions about it. And citizen science makes a huge contribution to conservation from your own backyard to the boreal. Birds and citizen science are a great way to bridge the divide between our digital world and the natural one, and they are the perfect tool to make exploration and outdoor adventure part of our everyday routine. In addition to being a citizen scientist, there are a number of easy ways any of us can help out birds. These include buying bird-friendly products, which can be things like organic produce or shade-grown coffee, or even items that limit the use of single-use plastics. Another way to help is by keeping your cat indoors since predation by domestic cats is a huge source of mortality for wild birds. Or if you're a dog owner, keeping your friend on a leash while on beaches, especially during breeding season, is also an important way that you can help birds. We can also help by making our yards and houses bird friendly, planting shrubs and brushes that provide shelter, native plants that provide seed and nectar, and leaving some brush out over winter can only improve the value of your property, but also help birds. Next, we can help to try to prevent window collisions by adding window decals that break up the reflection on glass and help bird recognize windows and buildings. And finally, turning out your lights can do a world of good for birds. Bright lights at night can confuse migrating birds. So especially during the spring and fall periods, like right now, close your curtains or blinds or turn off unneeded lights. You not only save money, but you'll be helping birds as well. Each of these are simple steps which any of us can take to, together make a huge positive impact for birds in our backyards and our communities. Now the wonderful thing is, when you help birds, your actions have a positive impact beyond your own backyard, your own community, and even your own country. Many bird species are migratory, which means that every spring they fly north to breed here in Canada, and every fall they return to the southern US and parts of Central and South America to overwinter. This means that many of the birds we see in our own backyards and work hard to protect locally rely on other habitats as well as the ones that we observe them in. 
in Canada, the boreal forest, which is shown in green on this slide, is one key, it's one key example of an essential habitat that's particularly important for many birds. It is known as Canada's bird nursery because over 300 species breed there and it accounts for the well-being of between three and five billion birds. This means that any actions we take in our own backyards and communities have a profound impact on conservation efforts across the continent and help bird species from coast to coast to coast. These are the messages we've been sharing with new audiences as we cross Canada, and we've been able to do that through presentations, radio interviews, and coverage in the media. We estimate that we've spoken directly with just over a thousand people about the goals of our hike. And by doing that, we've learned a few things along the way. First, there are a lot of people out there who don't necessarily identify as scientists, naturalists, or birders, but they are nonetheless very aware of the environmental challenges going on in their own communities. They are noticing the disappearance of birds at their feeder, and they are very concerned about it. They just don't know how to, how to help. The other thing that we've found is that many people don't become involved in science, exploration, or nature because they don't feel like they fit into these communities. In some cases, this is simply because they never considered exploration or birding as options. And in others, it's because representations of outdoors people tend to be monolithically Caucasian, and they just never considered that joining these communities was a possibility for them. In some ways, these discoveries represent good news because it means that if we can send out a message of empowerment, letting people know that no matter who they are, they can make a difference by getting involved. People are very ready to listen. They're thirsty for engagement and discovery. They want to help. We just have to let them know how to do that. So this brings us to what we've learned about outreach. Unsurprisingly, in this day and age, dynamic outreach online and through social media is necessary in order to engage with new and younger audiences. Unfortunately, this is often something that naturalist clubs and trail organizations which tend to have an older membership, really struggle to provide and engage with themselves. We've also found that when trying to spark the curiosity of new audiences, it's necessary to an, adapt a broader approach to outreach. This might sound very obvious, but it can actually be surprisingly difficult to do. If we advertise a bird talk, we found that people who aren't already birders or naturalists tend to assume either that it will be very dry and boring or that they won't understand what's going on because they aren't experts. On the other hand, if we say we're giving a talk featuring stories about the experiences, landscapes, and wildlife we've encountered while hiking the longest trail in the world, this tends to pique people's interest and reach a wider audience. So in other words, people respond better to storytelling and enthusiasm rather than to scientific facts, no matter how cool those facts may be to us scientists. Finally, we learned that providing a message of inclusion and empowerment was the most effective outreach strategy for us. Sharing those six simple steps to help birds and showing people which free apps they could use to become citizen scientists was a highly effective way to transform interest into action. Of course, not everything always goes as planned. In 2019, we had a few challenges. Our primary challenge came in scheduling, partially because of a number of situations which took us off the Great Trail, partially because of the nature of certain sections of the Great Trail, and partially because of the sheer number of presentations we were honored to receive. Ultimately, we ended 2019 about a month in a province behind where we projected we would be. As a result, we lost a number of opportunities in that year, and we now estimate the hike will take an additional year to complete, much to our parents' dismay. Our second challenge has been in obtaining sponsorship and funding for our expedition. This has been for a number of reasons. The first being that the three main branches of the route have already been completed by one intrepid individual, Dana Mizey. And the East to West corridor has been completed by two more on foot with two more amazing ladies set to finish in this coming year. As a result, while it's unique dike across Canada on the Great Trail to raise awareness for birds in natural spaces, the fact that we are not the first has led to a number of rejections. From other organizations, we've been told that hiking is not extreme enough and that science isn't interesting enough to support while others have bluntly told us that we're not visually attractive enough to sponsor. Adding to these challenges are the cutbacks to funding and sponsorship, which the current situation has brought about. Indeed, as of April 6th, our major sponsor is backed out and we've lost much of our support. Our third challenge has come in the form of the sheer number of unexpected responses to our trip. Now, don't get me wrong, most of these have been very positive and we've come to rely on the aid and help of many Canadians for which we're eternally grateful. 
However, the fact also is that we've not gone a single day in the past year without receiving negative rants by email, which have come from almost all quarters. We get lectured by birders and naturalists for not preserving certain species and highlighting them. We've received official correspondence from municipal politicians berating us. We've been contacted by groups telling us that we're judging them and their families for not having youth spend time in nature. And we've been targeted by local trail officials who don't like our comments online. And on more than one occasion, we were threatened by ATV groups. Overall, however, the amount of hatred we received online has stunned us, and it increases our concern about those youth who live online and may endure these types of commentary regularly. It increases our sense that youth need to have a balanced time in nature to offset this. And of course, our newest challenge has been the least expected of, of it all, COVID-19. Our initial plans to return to the Great Trail on April 1st, 2020 have clearly collapsed, and understandably so. Trail organizations are closing pathways, municipalities have shuttered campgrounds and lodgings, and Quebec itself has sealed its borders to non-essential travelers. In this past week, we've been contacted by regional tourist organizations asking us to stay away. City councillors informing us will be charged and arrested if we come into their area, and, because this, and we've become the subject of great online debate and ire from people who want us to stop hiking and those who demand that we continue. The majority of our arranged presentations have understandably been cancelled. As mentioned, most of our sponsorship and financial support has been revoked, and the notion of camping and hiking in communities already stressed by this situation simply makes it irresponsible for us to undertake hiking at this moment. As a result, it's led us to transform our outreach into increasingly digitally focused presentations like this one right here, offering free online presentations, providing virtual bird walks in our own community, and promoting the publication of articles on citizen science in the local media outlets. For this, we've received wonderful assistance from the Great Trail Organization itself. However, as it has been for everyone, this situation is a struggle. Our goal is, of course, to be back out on the Great Trail by the summer of 2020, being as, as socially responsible and isolated as possible while we trek. Our plans are to continue from Riviere de Lou westward and get to Manitoba by the end of 2020, putting us in place to get to Vancouver and Victoria by the conclusion of 2021 and Tuk Tayuk Tuk by the end of 2022. Right at this moment, we don't know exactly when we will be able to get back out onto the trail or what form this year's hike will take. Travel restrictions and closures are being updated daily, as are our plans. As of right now, though, we absolutely do intend to keep going this year. It's just a matter of determining when and how we will be able to do that responsibly. So if you'd like to follow our hike uh, online through our blog, Facebook, or Instagram, the links are on the screen right now. And we hope that you will take the opportunity to follow along as we continue our hike for birds over the coming three years. If you have any questions, uh, we can try to answer some of those now, or you can contact us online or by email, and we will do our best to answer any inquiries you might have. So thank you very much for taking the time to listen. I guess we will now switch back um, so you can see us and we will try to answer any questions you might have. Wonderful. Thank you very much, um, Sonia and Sean. That was a fabulous talk about, um, about obviously one of, the, one of the greatest trails in, in the world and, and a real treasure to Canada. <clears throat> I, I, I don't have a question at the moment. I'm going to let others take over for questions, but I do want to um, add two points. One, um, I noticed that people can actually, uh, I'll start my video to do, do. I noticed that people can actually deno donate to your, to your project if they want um, on, on comewalkwithus.online. So if those of you that are interested in supporting this fabulous work, um, at this time, you know, I know for many people money are tight, but some people are still faring well during this crisis. And if you have money to spare, this is a fantastic opportunity to help um, two people accomplish some, some great things for this country and for nature. And, and as a professor of One Health in the University of Guelph, I do have to say a disregard for nature has got us into the position we currently are in. And so maybe if more people spent time outside and got to understand nature more, we would understand how interacting with wildlife in the ways we have in the past have resulted in, in what is essentially a global catastrophe. So I think this is a timely expedition in that we really need to connect with nature more so now than at any point, maybe in human history. And I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that. 
Um, so I want to point out that there's a lot of ways you can ask questions. Those of you that are in the Zoom uh, meeting, you can ask questions here. Um, maybe just uh, uh, just uh, unmute your mic and, and and jump away. But also in the in the YouTube um, on the on the chat bar on the side, it's uh, you should be able to ask questions. Should be on the right hand side. You'll be able to ask questions through YouTube as well. So feel free to send those in and we'll get to each in turn. So does anyone in the Zoom meeting have any questions? Looks like George, I see, has one. Yeah, it's amazing. Quite an undertaking uh, that you guys are, are in the middle of here. And I wish you all the all the best luck. I have sort of a logistics and, and, and route question for you. How, how do you deal with the... The little side trails and the spots where the where the trail like, like the section that goes down to Windsor and then do you, do you do that entire stretch and then walk back or how do you, how do you deal with these little incongruities in the trail? Well, so far we've we've just been going east to west, kind of in a fairly direct line. We were actually set to leave, I guess, on Monday to to walk down to Windsor, um, and we've decided that we just can't do that right now um, because of the current situation. But generally we're just, we're, we're not doing the entire, every square inch of the trail. There are branches that go off it. We're more or less just taking kind of a direct route across. I mean, it's not direct, it goes all over the place, but. <laughs> we, did, we did take the branch down to Halifax though. That's true. And we yeah. took public transit afterwards. We, we walked through Nova Scotia up to the ferry terminal and then walked back down to Halifax and took public transit from Halifax then up back to the ferry terminal in that one instance. But I think that was a rare instance yeah. for us. Right, if you've already done that section of trail once, you don't need to walk it back, right? You can just you took the, the transit back. It's tempting, Nova Scotia is beautiful. You don't wanna leave Nova Scotia. But... <laughs> yeah, but you're already, you're already behind as you yeah. well know. That, that trip to Halifax was a contributing factor to that. <laughs> Great. Any other questions uh, from the team in Zoom here? And, uh, and uh, Joe, I guess you'll let me know if there's any more. I see Marlise has a question. Yeah. Uh, so um, I congratulate you on uh, your accomplishment so far. It's fabulous. Absolutely amazing. Um, and yeah, I totally get uh, the challenges right now. Um, I mean, we've had to, the Bruce Trail Conservancy, we've had to ask our members to stay off the trails because, of course, uh, with fewer and fewer places where the public can congregate, they are congregating in major masses in the few places left available. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's creating a major problem for all trail associations and uh, networks. Um, uh, uh, liability issues come along with that. So we've asked all our members to stop using the trails. So yeah, I can see, and I totally appreciate your challenge on that. It's um, yeah, it's got to be frustrating. I, I totally get that, but I hope you can pick up again later on in the year and continue on. Well, I think we'll be able to continue on, certainly. It's just a matter of when to do it responsibly. I mean, I think a lot of people uh, want to get into nature, as you're seeing on the Bruce Trail. Uh, they want to spend time on trails, but it don't, this situation only resolves once we're all responsible. And it, it wouldn't do, I don't think, for us to... Uh, serve as an example of being irresponsible at the moment or to put a burden on trail systems and spring thaw or on small communities that are dealing with their own issues at the moment. That's just not the way this works. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to comment on, which I really loved and um, uh, I would love to hear if you have any other ideas on how to reach out to the non-standard uh, stereotypical hikers and outdoors people in North America. Uh, yes, I look at, I'm looking for ideas for the Bruce Trail Conservancy, of course. Uh, yeah, uh, primarily, uh, as one of our members said, yeah, we're, we have um, hikers initiating uh, programs and stuff like that. And it's a bunch of old white guys standing in front of an audience in Toronto that's um, multicolored and mm -hmm. multi-ethnical. Um, any ideas uh, that you can share? Greatly, that would be greatly appreciated. I think for the main, in the main way, most people of different ethnic backgrounds have just never heard anyone say, you're welcome here. And it just doesn't become something they consider as a result. Mm -hmm. I think beyond that, the biggest thing is to keep pushing diversity. 
uh, when you start looking at outdoor stores and ads on outdoors um, equipment, a lot of it is white people. And yeah. I think that's really unfortunate because I don't, I don't think anyone here wants to actively exclude anyone, but somehow we've wound up in this situation where we are visually excluding people. And that's led to unfortunate consequences beyond outreach. Sonia would probably know better. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we've, we're following a number of people from different ethnic backgrounds online now who are very active hikers and campers and mm -hmm. Teach they're, us a lot. they're, yeah, they're teaching <laughs> us a lot. Like they're opening our eyes to stuff we never knew. I mean, we didn't realize how important it was to say, like, we're, our goal is to encourage everyone to get out here and to kind of list off those things. We had no idea till people started talking to us that that was something that needed to be said. And so by reaching out to those people, um, you learn a lot from them. I guess we've done a lot of talks in libraries um, and national parks, provincial parks, things like that, where you're reaching out to sort of a broader audience. Mm -hmm. And if you can bring those people in to maybe do a talk with you or just sort of connect with them and, and actually bring them into the community, I think that's a good place to start. Even just saying it though, like you're all welcome here, no matter what your background is, seems to be a message that's powerful that we had no idea before we started doing this, that that was. I guess in terms of outreach, we've talked in a lot of places that uh, outdoors agencies and organizations have never talked at. We just gave four talks at the Toronto Outdoor and Adventure Show uh, alongside hunters and extreme sports enthusiasts. Um, birding clubs don't go there, but we packed our seats in all four talks and we did well and it was just a different venue. We've talked in libraries, we've talked in classrooms to girl guide groups. Um, it's just a variety of different approaches. Some things work, sometimes, sometimes they don't. So it's a good question and it's an essential question. Thank you. All right, so I've got a question. So obviously a big part of the journey is uh, the birds, are there any sightings that you're particularly excited about that you've had so far? And is there something you're really hoping to see along the way? I don't know. I guess some of the, the greatest birding moments were the, the, the puffin colonies in, in Newfoundland um, at, at Bay Bulls there. There were just tens of thousands of puffins circling overhead and face planting into the ocean. And we were right in the middle of it. And that was absolutely fantastic. We also went out to Cape St. Mary's where there's a huge colony of Northern gannets. So again, it was just thousands of gannets nesting on these rocks where you could basically walk right up to them and see them. I guess one of our favorite bird moments on the trail was just seeing a great horned owl. Um, we're both like super excited about owls, but we never see them. Like it's just, they're everywhere. And we, we, we just, we, we have no luck with owls. So seeing this, this great horned owl just sitting on the side of the trail one morning. We'd gotten up early, we were just heading out and it just kind of flew from tree to tree in front of us down the trail. That was like super exciting. I think one of the things I'm most excited to see are greater prairie chickens in the prairies. <laughs> They're like one of the most ridiculous looking birds ever and I've never seen one. Um, I don't know. <laughs> For me, I don't think it's a specific type of bird. Uh, there's this mistaken impression because Sonia has worked at Bird Studies Canada that she's an expert in birding. Um, that she has a PhD, she's an expert in all things biology, and that's not true. It's wonderful to walk into these new communities. Uh, we just had um, opportunities in Vancouver. We were taken aside by the Burke Mountain Naturalists and taken on a bird walk by them, and we didn't know their hot spots. We didn't know what birds they have necessarily, and so to hear from people in different locations about what makes their birds important and to in be introduced to their birds and their birding spots is big for me. So that's the most fun part of this for us is like learning about all the different local areas and everybody's stories about what goes on there like that's the best part of this <laughs> that's awesome the um I, I actually could ask you a million questions i'm gonna ask one about um about urbanism we see urbanism is increasing i think something like 80 percent of people live in cities in canada which is flip flop from about 80 years ago. And I think you mentioned roughly 80% are within a, with relatively close to this trail. Um, I've spent a lot of my time in what we call wilderness 
but I've taken to a lot of the amazing urban areas that are near me now because I, I've noticed there's a lot of great urban wildlife. In fact, today I saw a common merganser just on my walk. Um, can you speak to on the travel so far? Have you was there that uh, uh, one particular urban environment that you were ex that you've seen already that you thought was am amazing? You've mentioned a few, um, and then maybe an urban environment. Or that you're excited to to experience um, uh, on the on the rest of the expedition. I don't know. <laughs> That's a really good question. It's kind of hard to answer. I I'm excited for Montreal, yeah. but well, I'm also excited to see places like Whitehorse and Tuk Tuk Tuk. So, I mean, not typically what we consider here in Canada to be urban environments, but there are some big cities north of here that are going to be interesting to see. I think one of the most exciting ones we've been to was maybe St. John's, Newfoundland, because the trail there go like it goes right into the town, but I don't know, within 20 minutes or so you're up, like you can go just up onto the hills and it feels like you're in the middle of the wilderness, like almost right away. You're on the top of these tall cliffs and it's just rocky and there's sort of boreal vegetation and birds. And if you're lucky, you can see whales out, like you're right on the coast. So if you look one way, you can kind of look into the harbor around St. John's and the other way is out to the ocean. And you're on this little footpath. Um, I, I really enjoyed that because it was kind of, you felt like you were actually in nature without being that far from the city. I guess that's one of the most amazing parts of this trail is that for many of us, the access to nature is right out of our back door. We don't have to travel across the whole country to see amazing things. Um, and you're highlighting that, I guess, for each person as we, you go across this, this entire nation. I think it's essential that people realize that you don't have to, like for here in Ontario, travel to Algonquin Park, which is often very full now, or travel across the world or go on the Camino de Santiago to have a, this natural experience. In a lot of the places we live, if you take a minute and you realize that nature is in your own backyard, there's a lot of worlds that can open up to. Wonderful. Especially at the moment when you aren't supposed to be wandering communities, uh, setting your kids loose in your backyard with a cell phone and iNaturalist can actually be a lot of fun. <laughs> Does anyone else have any more questions out of the Zoom meeting here? Or Joe, did anyone in the, um, in the YouTube uh, send any questions? No, we've definitely got people viewing on the YouTube, but they're being shy. So use that chat sidebar on the right and uh, send us in a question. Don't be shy. I see you George see, has one. We can see you quick, watching. Just a quick question. You, you sold your, most of your possessions in your home. So where are you riding this out right now? Where, where are you staying with a friend or are you, are you couch surfing? What, what's your current situation as in like immediate current situation? We house sat, we got three wonderful offers over the winter time when we came off the trail and we house sat until 10 days ago. <laughs> and then the house owners came back. And so we are at a local hotel in London, Ontario and we're riding it out at the moment expensively riding it out at the moment so we are desperately hoping things resolve as quickly as reasonably possible but currently yes we're in a motel we got lucky to get in one we are grateful for that actually a lot of things got shuttered and there's a lot of people in more desperate straits than us and so we got very lucky it's a question our parents asked though <laughs> on march 31st <laughs> I, I asked the question but i won't judge you because it's no, no, no. That's, that's your parents job <laughs> Well, maybe someone watching this uh, YouTube feed or others will maybe extend a hand and and, uh, and house a few uh, uh, explorers as they're going across this country and waiting out this uh, natural this um, this crisis that we're facing. Mm -hmm. um, anyone else? I know we got a few people off camera. Um, does anyone uh, want to from that are off camera with their mic off want to mention anything? I think we got Amanda Gill, David Galbraith, Kevin Brown, um, Peter. I think. Uh, oh, I see you on camera. Anybody else have any questions? I'm going to jump in with a logistics question here. Um, you know, sometimes I drive my wife crazy just by sitting next to her on the couch. So mm -hmm. I'm curious as to, you know, you're together so much of the time. What are some tips for being together so much of the time on the trail and just getting along? Knowing when you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we seem to mesh. Okay, everyone has that question. Everyone walks the Camino or the Appalachian Trail and they're like, my goodness, the two of you are together 24 hours a day. How do you handle it? But it hasn't so far, at least for me, been that stressful. 
I don't know if we're selling it. I can leave the room while she answers. No, I think we're lucky. And I, like we, we spent a lot of time together every day before we did this and we did all those long distance hikes before. So I think if anyone was considering heading out on a track like this, I would say definitely make sure that you can stand being with the person you're with all the time before you set out. But we, I think we complement each other. Like we have different strengths and we work well together. Mm -hmm. And it just, we I guess we're really lucky. I don't know, a lot of people kind of said that, like, you guys are going to kill each other. You're going to be done like a month in, but yeah, we've been a problem. We have different interests that offset things. Uh, I'm not a birding photographer by nature. Uh, so s having Sonia teach me about birds as we go has been one thing. And even right now, we've been building bird feeders and doing videos online for how kids can build bird feeders, which has been interesting and challenging. Um, and learning to photograph birds on the feeder, learning how to photograph from a drone at the moment. There's lots of things that keep us occupied and out of each other's air. Wonderful. How about any other questions? So it's Melise, I just shared a photograph behind me. Um, I was up at uh, Tuktoyuk Duck. Uh, last year with one of my last national parks, actually, sorry, two years ago, uh, while visiting my last national parks, and I uh, just put a photograph behind me here. Uh, that's the uh, northern terminus of the Trans-Canada Trail, or Great Trail. Um, my one recommendation to you, now I did not walk it, by the way, <laughs> um, um, but my one recommendation to you is make sure you don't just have a bug net, but a whole bug jacket. The mosquitoes up there are totally insane. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you. <laughs> envy you getting to go up there. It looks gorgeous. Uh, yeah, I had just come back from uh, Vuntut National Park and was on my way over to Wood Buffalo National Park. So since we were in Inuvik, decided to do the drive up the new highway, the new all season all year highway up to Tuck and uh, yeah. Very nice. Wonderful. Joe, is there anyone on YouTube? Looks like they're silent. Nope, your mic's off. Okay, great. And then George, do you have anything else you want to add before I wrap up? Oh, I just want to thank you guys for uh, for coming out tonight, sharing your story. That's great. I, I, I look forward to hearing updates from you as uh, as the journey progresses and i hope that you're able to get back out there on the trail sooner rather than later we all want this to be over quickly and i'm sure you're chomping at the bit to get back out there especially now that spring is spring is here and the weather's getting warm and it's becoming the perfect time to get back out there and you're sitting there and being told you can't go and you you know it's the right thing to do to sit down and wait it out but hopefully it's over soon for you Thank you. <laughs> and I wanted to That's mention the game story. that um, if you go to comewalkwithus.online, um, I've noticed they have some cool t-shirts. There's an easy way to donate. You click a button and they ask for, and then you can uh, support this amazing project. Um, yeah, this, is, this has been a fabulous talk. I really appreciate you, Sean and Sonia, coming to share with us um, your, the, while you're en route on your expedition and then dealing with the trials and tribulations of this. And I love that you've really tried to incorporate um, new people to, to sort of engaging with nature. I'll give a shout out to Mario Rigby. He's another club member who has um, very actively tried to promote people of color engaging with the outdoor industry. And he has said the same as you, is that it's, it's, it's not an industry that has engaged with that community before. And hopefully it'll change in the future. And I think um, having people like you acknowledge that and, 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 and to try to incorporate others in it as well. And I'm astonished at the number of talks that you've done while en route on an expedition, because that's not an easy feat. So I want to thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, this has been our first um, Explorers Club uh, Canada, uh, Explorers Club Toronto going live to Canada. Uh, we'll have another one next month on the second Friday. Uh, I don't know what date that is, but it's May something or other. I can look right now, uh, May 8th. And I'm just reminded by the person who's giving a talk. My partner's giving a talk about her book, Chasing Lemurs. Um, you can buy them. The bookstores will deliver them to your house. 
uh, if anyone's interested in getting one, but you'll hear a talk about that uh, next month. And um, again, thank, uh, thank you, Sean and Sonia for sharing uh, your amazing expedition with us. Thank you. All right, everyone, this is it and have a good night and everyone stay safe and stay healthy.